Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we are going to be looking at Chapter 15, Section 3, A Call for Women's Rights. And our essential question for today is, how did the movement for women's rights begin in the United States? Now, we were teased with that a little bit in yesterday's video. Um, we talked about the abolitionist movement, and that especially when we talked about the Grimke sisters that being an interesting offshoot of the abolitionist movement, and they really kind of got the ball rolling for the call for women's rights because a lot of the abolitionists at that time, like they were women joining the movement, but men wouldn't listen to them because they were women. And so some of them looked around and said, we're trying to fight for the rights of slaves. Why don't we fight for some of our own rights too? So we're going to talk all about that today. All right, so uh, let's move on to our key terms, of which today there are only two. And our key terms for today are the Seneca Falls Convention and the Women's Rights Movement. Both uh, kind of go hand in hand. But uh, again, we will be getting into those very shortly. 1776, 1783, 1812, 1861, uh, 1941, 1969. What do these years have in common? Now, the first few dates may sound familiar. You may remember 1776, America's birthday. Uh, 1783, uh, the Constitution was adopted. 1812, that one's pretty obvious. Uh, while others, uh, you don't know yet. 1861, that was the official beginning of the Civil War. Uh, 1941, the United States entered World War II. But what all of these years have in common is that each year sparked the beginning of something significant to the growth of the United States. And soon enough, we will be getting into the Civil War and finding out why 1861 is so important. But today, I would like to talk about a year that was e extremely important to all Americans. And that year is 1848. And rather than tell you myself, I'm going to let the people in our first video explain why 1848 is such an important year to our identity as American citizens. I was born and lived almost 40 years in one of the most secluded spots in western New York. But from the earliest dawn of reason, I pined for that freedom of thought and action that was then denied to all womankind. I revolted in spirit against the customs of society and the laws of the state that crushed my aspirations and debarred me from the pursuit of almost every object worthy of an intelligent, rational mind. But not until that meeting in Seneca Falls in 1848 gave this feeling of unrest form and voice. Did I take action? Emily Collins. 1848 was a year of revolution. In Paris, mobs toppled the King of France. Rome declared itself a republic and drove the Pope from the Vatican. There were violent uprisings in Prague, Berlin, Vienna, Venice, Warsaw. In London, a German journalist named Karl Marx called upon the workers of the world to unite against their masters. But in America, on July 11th, in Seneca Falls, New York, a brief notice in the county courier signaled the start of a revolution with more lasting consequences than any of the others. Women's Rights Convention. A convention to discuss the social, civil, and religious condition and rights of woman will be held in the Wesleyan Chapel at Seneca Falls, New York on Wednesday and Thursday, the 19th and 20th of July current, commencing at 10 o'clock a.m. No such meeting had ever taken place anywhere before. It was the brainchild of five women. Four were Quakers. The fifth and youngest was a 33-year-old newcomer to town, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. 
The object of the convention, Stanton remembered, was to inaugurate nothing less than a rebellion, to overthrow the customs and laws that had kept women powerless for centuries. In the middle of the 19th century, women were, by custom, barred from the pulpit and the professions, prevented from attending college, and those who dared speak in public were thought indecent. By law, married women were prohibited from owning or inheriting property. In fact, wives were the property of their husbands, entitled by law to her wages and her body. You had no rights. That translates, no rights translates into no right to property, no right to sign contracts, no right to your children, no right to the clothes on your back. If you were so bold as to escape a dreadful marriage, you took your clothes, what, your one outfit with you, not your children, not your suitcase. You got nothing. No women could serve on a jury, and most were considered incompetent to testify. And the ballot by which women might have voted to improve their status was denied to them by law. Nowhere in America, nowhere in the world, did women have the right to vote. But in 1848, a young wife and mother was determined to change all that. Now, we started our discussion yesterday with a look at the, quote, all men section of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, all men are supposedly created equal, but what about women? Some of the most outspoken reformers of this time period were women, but many people wouldn't listen to them simply because they were women. It didn't matter what they had to say because they were women. So as reformers spoke out against about the injustices of slavery and the injustices in the hospitals and prison systems, some began pushing for equal rights for women. Women in the early 1800s, they didn't really have a very large place in society. They could not vote or hold office. Uh, when a woman got married, her husband became the owner of all of her property, and if she worked, all of her wages belonged to the husband. A husband could hit his wife as long as he didn't seriously hurt her. Uh, and in the mid-1800s, some women and men started to look at things and decided that we needed to make a change. And some of these women and men began to work for women's rights. And three of the most famous women of this era that pushed for equal rights were Sojourner Truth, Lucretia Mott, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. First up, Sojourner Truth. Uh, she had been born into slavery in New York while New York still had slavery. And after she gained her freedom, she started believing that God wanted her to travel around the country and speak the truth about slavery. So she changed her name from Isabella to Sojourner Truth. And the word sojourn means to travel. So she actually changed her name to mean uh, traveling to tell the truth. And she taught that the idea that women were inferior to men was completely ridiculous because as a slave, she had done the same work as men and worked the same long hours. Uh, and if male and female slaves were required to perform the same tasks, and slaves should have equality with free Americans, then women should be included in that equality. So that's a, that's a very logical way of going about it. Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were both abolitionists who started pushing for women's rights as well as the abolition of slavery. Uh, Mott was a mother of five, so she wasn't able to travel as much, but she was very good at organizing and was able to put together petition drives across the North. Stanton was extremely intelligent and when she was younger she had been an athlete, but was rarely encouraged by her father, the judge, because she was a girl. Both women went to 
an anti-slavery convention in London, and because they were women, they weren't allowed to speak. But that kind of caused them to, once they returned to the United States, to push even harder for women's rights. And our next video is going to dive into their lives as well as the life of Sojourner Truth a little bit more, and then we'll pick up right after that. Two days after they were married in May of 1840, Elizabeth and Henry Stanton traveled to London for the first World Anti-Slavery Convention. They were part of a large delegation of both men and women that included the most prominent abolitionist in America, Wendell Phillips and William Lloyd Garrison. But the female abolitionists quickly discovered they were not welcome. Those who wished to attend the convention were forced to sit in a segregated screen section and were forbidden to speak or vote. Wendell Phillips was outraged. So was William Lloyd Garrison, who refused to take his seat as a delegate and sat instead in the ladies' section. I can take no part in a convention, he said, that strikes down the most sacred rights of all women. Elizabeth listened, fascinated, as the argument raged. She watched as minister after minister stood up and held their Bible aloft and said that the book preached that women should not take part in assemblies of men, that the women should keep silent. That moment, I think, was the moment of seeing immediately the connection between the fight for the rights of slaves and the fight for the rights of women. She saw that the voices of women were silenced in asking for the rights of the slave. And the connection and the need to work for both was there. Elizabeth spent the rest of the convention sitting behind the screen with the most celebrated of all the women delegates, Lucretia Mott. Lucretia Mott was a Quaker minister from Philadelphia who had already helped establish the first female anti-slavery society in the world. She was so committed to her cause that she refused to wear cotton or serve sugar at her table because both depended on the labor of slaves. Elizabeth had never met anyone like her. Mrs. Mott was to me an entire new revelation of womanhood. When I first heard from her lips that I had the same right to think for myself that Luther, Calvin, and John Knox had, and the same right to be guided by my own convictions, I felt at once a newborn sense of dignity and freedom. The most important moment is when she meets Lucretia Mott. It's a turning point in her life. And in Mott, she finds the role model of her future. As the convention adjourned, the remark was heard on all sides. It is about time some demand was made for new liberties for women. As Mrs. Mott and I walked home arm in arm, we resolved to hold a convention as soon as we returned home to America and form a society to advocate the rights of women. In ancient Greece, she would have been a Stoic, in the era of the Reformation, a Calvinist. In King Charles's time, a Puritan. But in the 19th century, by the very law of her being, she is a reformer. After 10 years of teaching school, Susan B. Anthony had grown bored and dissatisfied. She was 29 and her future seemed hopelessly constricted. She could continue teaching, she could marry, or she could return home as what was then called an old maid. You had to make a choice to stay single, as Anthony did. 
when she talks about singleness, she always talks about it in terms of independence and equality. That when men regard their wives as equals, then it might be time for her to think about marriage. But that, I think, is as much converting her own condition into a political statement as anything else. Sympathetic to her growing discontent, Anthony's parents tried to help. Her father's fortunes had improved. He was now a successful businessman in Rochester, and he offered to let her run the family farm if she liked. During the 1840s, Western New York had become a hotbed of religious radicalism and political and social reforms of every kind. And when Anthony came home, she found that her father's house was a meeting place for anti-slavery and temperance leaders. At their farm home, right outside of Rochester, she was meeting the reformers of the day. William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, Frederick Douglass, John Brown, Amy Post. She was serving coffee and tea to these people, but anxious to be in on the conversation. And she just, I think, got swept up in it. Inspired by the example of her father's visitors, moved by their passion, she determined against all the odds to see if she, a single woman, couldn't find a way to work full time as a reformer. Susan Anthony was raised in a reformer's family. So that the notion that you have a responsibility to make a better world and that that is a sufficient calling for one's life is there. Susan B. Anthony's first cause was temperance, the most widespread reform movement of the time. On the surface, temperance was about sobriety and clean living, but Anthony and other women believed it was the key to stopping the outrage of domestic violence, spousal rape, and the drinking up of family income. But for Anthony, every social wrong needed to be righted, and she soon hurled herself as well into the most contentious of all reforms, abolition. She began to feed and shelter runaway slaves, and at a temperance festival in Rochester, she shocked the women present by urging them to have as much sympathy for the slave women of the South as they had for the battered wives of drunkards. I I think she's probably driven in a way that is not always comfortable. I don't think she could sit still. It's lucky for her that she found a political objective for all that restlessness and remarkable energy. I can't even imagine where that forcefulness would have gone had she not had a political purpose. She begins to meet some of the leading anti-slavery women who have developed a vocation out of reform, become very good platform speakers and understand how to go and organize a meeting in a small town and how to circulate petitions. She's being called Napoleon within a few months of starting that kind of work. She discovered something she was awfully good at. So it made sense to keep going at it. After they returned from the London Anti-Slavery Convention, the Stantons moved to Boston and into a handsome house staffed with servants. Henry pursued a career in law and anti-slavery politics. Elizabeth gave birth to three boys, Daniel, Henry, and Garrett, and showed all the outward signs of becoming a conventional young matron. It is a proud moment in a woman's life to reign supreme within four walls, to be the one to whom all questions of domestic pleasure and economy are referred. I studied up everything pertaining to housekeeping and enjoyed it all. Elizabeth loved Boston, 
It was a kind of moral museum, she said. The Stantons got to know the region's most eminent writers and reformers. Bronson Alcott, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Theodore Parker, William Ellery Channing, Ralph Waldo Emerson. All sorts of new ideas are seething, she told her mother, but I haven't either time or place to enumerate them. And if I did, you and my good father would probably balk at most of them. But in the spring of 1847, Henry's law firm broke up, and strapped for cash, the Stantons decided to move to the little upstate New York town of Seneca Falls. Judge Cady bought them a house at 32 Washington Street. Henry spent most of his time away from home pursuing anti-slavery politics. Elizabeth was left alone to care for the household. She hated small town life, the muddy roads, the domestic drudgery, the drunken neighbors, the overly conventional townspeople whom she shocked by raising a flag to denote the birth of each new baby in an age when childbirth was not to be mentioned in polite company. She suffered, she remembered, from mental hunger, could find nothing that would bring into play my higher faculties. In moving to Seneca Falls, Stanton was no longer the pampered wife. She had to put up with little children, lots of responsibilities, an absent husband. And she personalizes for the first time how difficult life is for the majority of American white northern women. It's to her credit that she can extrapolate from that and not want only to vent about her own discomfort, but to expand and think about the rights of all women. In the summer of 1848, she heard that her old friend, Lucretia Mott, was coming to town. It had been eight years since they first promised each other in London to hold a convention on women's rights. In early July 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton got an invitation to tea at the home of Jane and Richard Hunt, and she sat down with four other women and transformed what might have been a simple discussion of some of the events in Quaker history into a movement for social change. She said, I poured out the torrent of my long-standing discontent and I challenged them to do and dare anything. They determined to hold a convention. It's a very 1840s solution. I have a problem, I'll hold a public meeting, like the abolitionists would. But the women weren't really sure what to do next. Meeting around a circular mahogany table in Mary Ann McClintock's parlor, Stanton recalled that they were at first as helpless and hopeless as if we had been suddenly asked to construct a steam engine. Finally, they decided to draft a statement for the convention to consider. A declaration of rights and sentiments, they called it, that would enumerate the rights of women. They had all been inspired by the work of the pioneer 18th century British feminist, Mary Wollstonecraft. But in the end, Stanton and her friends chose to model their revolutionary document after Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. Now, at the beginning of our discussion today, I mentioned... 1848 being a very important year to us as Americans. Well, now we're going to talk about it. In 1848, in Seneca Falls, New York, Stanton, Mott, and about 200 women and 40 men attended the Seneca Falls Convention. And the convention met to show the problems that were facing women in the United States and during the convention, those in attendance drew up the Declaration of Sentiments, and they modeled it after the Declaration of Independence. And in the Declaration of Sentiments, uh, it stated that all men and women are, were created equal. And the purpose of the convention was to decide exactly what rights they were going to push for. Um, at this time, we said that women really 
didn't have any rights of their own, but in order for the movement to succeed, everyone had to agree on specific rights, like equality at work, uh, at the school, at church, um, things like that. So all these, these 200 women and 40 men came together and decided, okay, these are the rights, these are the specific rights that we are going to push for. And the only resolution that met with opposition was the right to vote. And eventually that resolution was passed by only a very narrow, narrow margin. Even the people in attendance thought that pushing for the right to vote would be almost like asking too much or trying to go trying to go and do too much. And this convention, the Seneca Falls Convention, marks the official beginning of the women's rights movement. And the women's rights movement is the organized campaign for equal rights between men and women. And following this, other leaders joined this movement, including Frederick Douglass, who we spoke about last time, and Susan B. Anthony. Anthony traveled the country giving speeches about women's rights, um, and she was heckled, she had people throwing eggs at her, and despite all of that, she always finished her speech. And in the years following the Seneca Falls Convention, uh, the women's rights movement was able to to win some legal rights in the states. And success was being made for women to own property and to be able to keep their own wages, but it really didn't have any success in the voting aspect until the 1920s. And slowly but surely, the women's rights movement grew in popularity, but there were still many men and women opposed to the women's rights movement. And why do you think that women would be opposed to the women's rights movement? It doesn't seem to make sense. At first we traveled quite alone. But before we had gone many miles, we came on other wagon loads of women, bound in the same direction. As we reached the different crossroads, we saw wagons coming from every part of the county. And long before we reached Seneca Falls, we were a procession. The first Women's Rights Convention in history began at 10 a.m. at the Wesleyan Methodist Chapel in Seneca Falls, New York, on the morning of July 19, 1848. That day, only women were allowed to attend. But on the 20th, the convention was open to all, and more than 300 women and men, shopkeepers and farmers and mill workers, clergymen and wives and mothers, filed into the chapel. They would be asked to vote Stanton's Declaration of Rights and Sentiments up or down. None of the women who had organized the convention felt qualified to act as chair. So Lucretia Mott's husband, James, agreed to preside. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was so nervous to be speaking in public that at first she could barely be heard. I should feel exceedingly diffident to appear before you at this time, having never spoken in public, were I not served by a sense of right and duty. Did I not feel that the time had come for the question of woman's wrongs to be laid before the public? Did I not believe that woman herself must do this work? For woman alone understands the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of her degradation. Then she began to read her declaration. When in the course of human events... And so she stood up and she began reading. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary, etc. And her audience knew those words by heart. They had memorized them. They had heard them every 4th of July since they were kids. So even the smallest change in that declaration is going to be startling to them. 
we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that phrase jolted the people at the convention, the people of the country, and still calls to us today. Emboldened, Stanton went on. She charged that men had systematically deprived women of their rights, kept them from equal education and the professions, and barred wives from obtaining divorce and the custody of their children. Late that afternoon, 68 women and 32 men fixed their signatures to the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments. Stanton next offered 11 additional resolutions for the convention to ratify. Ten passed without dissent. The last was the most revolutionary. It demanded that women be given the right to vote. The resolutions from the Declaration are presented, and there's a hush and a kind of gasp in the audience that she could be so bold as to suggest the right to vote. People didn't think they were smart enough to do it, that they were powerful enough to do it. Some people dismissed them as because they had male protectors, they didn't need to do it, their vote would be exactly like a male vote. It's hard in this century, I think, to even imagine how startling this was. Absolutely outrageous. Stanton's husband, Henry, had favored the declaration, but thought asking for the vote would make the whole proceeding a farce. Even Lucretia Mott was concerned. Lizzie, she told Stanton, thou wilt make the convention ridiculous. Elizabeth Cady Stanton would not back down. The right to vote is ours, she said bravely. Have it we must. Use it, we will. But privately, she feared she would be unable to persuade the crowd to rally to her cause. Then a man in the audience asked to be recognized. He rose to his feet. It was the former slave and abolitionist orator, Frederick Douglass. Without the vote, he thundered, women would be unable to change the laws that treated them unjustly. All that distinguishes man as an intelligent and accountable being is equally true of woman. And if that government only is just, which governs by the free consent of the governed, there can be no reason in the world for denying to woman the exercise of the elective franchise. Our doctrine is that right is of no sex. Douglas's eloquence helped carry the day. The resolution supporting a woman's right to vote passed, and the convention adjourned. Now, small groups of women and a scattering of sympathetic men began to meet in other New York towns, and in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts, galvanized by Stanton's declaration. Living in the country, where the population is sparse, we are consequently few, but hope to make up in zeal and energy for our lack of numbers. I summoned a few women in our neighborhood together and formed an equal suffrage society and sent petitions to our legislature. It was received by the legislature as something absurdly ridiculous. Emily Collins. Preachers across the country denounced the convention as unseemly. Editorial writers ridiculed the whole idea of women acting on their own. The women folks have just held a convention up in New York and passed a sort of Bill of Rights, affirming it their right to vote, to become teachers, legislators, lawyers, divines, and do all and sundry the lords now do. They should have resolved at the same time that it was obligatory for the lords aforesaid to wash dishes, handle the broom, don stockings, wear trinkets, look beautiful, 
and be as fascinating as those blessed morsels of humanity whom God gave to preserve that rough animal man in something like reasonable civilization. Lowell, Massachusetts Courier. The Seneca Falls Declaration had come 72 years after the Declaration of Independence. It would be 72 more years before women attained the full citizenship that Elizabeth Cady Stanton declared to be their birthright. But the struggle for women's rights had begun. And in the Seneca Falls Convention, one of the areas that was almost completely agreed upon by everybody was equality in education. In order for women to be considered equal with men, they should have the same opportunities in education first. And education is the key to equality. In the early 1800s, women from poor families had very little hope of, of even learning how to read. Very little emphasis was placed on educating women because their place was in the home, not in the workforce. If all a woman was expected to do was to care for her family, then why would she need an education? And girls that were able to go to school were often taught dancing and drawing instead of science or math. Reformers worked to improve this idea of education for women. High schools and colleges were open in northern states just for women. And the first college for women in the United States was Mount Holyoke Female Seminary in Massachusetts. And its founder, Mary Lyon, didn't call the school a college because so many people still thought that it was wrong for women to attend college. So she opened a college but referred to it as a seminary so that people would be like, oh, it's just a seminary. It's not an actual college, even though it was. And it was at this time that a few of the all-male colleges started admitting female students, and most of these female students became teachers after graduating. And a few women entered the medical field or other areas of science, as we saw in the previous video. And with these new careers opening up to women, slowly but surely, the dream of equality, and these dreams of equality were being made into reality. But there would still be a very long way to go before the right to vote, or full equality, would be realized. Which brings us to our assignment for today. Now, in today's assignment, we're going to be posting in the forum, and in your post, I want you to answer these three questions, but do so in a paragraph. I'm looking for a paragraph, not just a list of answers. So think of these as like sentence starters or to kind of get your ideas, get them in motion. First off, what legal rights did women have and which ones did they lack? in the mid-1800s. Uh, what was the purpose of the Seneca Falls Convention? And why do you think the right to vote is so important to people? So those three things, legal rights women lacked in the 1800s, the purpose of the Seneca Falls Convention, and why is the right to vote so important? Now to receive full credit for this forum, you must first post your own paragraph which is out of 10 points, and then reply to at least two classmates, and you can get up to two points each time you reply for a total of 14 points. Now, you can reply more than twice, but you need to do it at least twice. So, all right, with that, I want you to go back, review everything. Good luck with the forum. I look forward to reading your posts, and like always, if you have any questions, please come and find me. Have a great rest of your day.